please welcome to the stage from Crystal Bridges, Michelle Finnamore and Ruben Toledo. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here. This has been such an amazing, kind of awe-inspiring and thought-provoking day. Uh, so thank you to the CFDA for organizing this and obviously to Crystal Bridges. So anyway, I can't imagine anyone else I would love to sit here with than Ruben Toledo. Um, so thank you. we are, um, I am so happy that he joined the process of um, crafting Fashioning America. Sorry, that's a little bit echoey. Um, anyway, uh, what we're going to do today is talk through the show a bit. Um, I'm not going to focus on specific designers as much because we don't have a lot of time and I want Ruben to kind of talk about a lot of his design process um, for the exhibition. Uh, he was a design consultant for, for the exhibition and has done a beautiful job kind of interpreting the different themes. Um, so um, you see one design up there on, this, on the screen. And Ruben, I don't know if you want to just say well, Hello, first of all, thank you, and um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor. Um, basically, uh, as a consultant for the design of the show, I, I try to create a whole u universe. Um, they asked for a few things, and I probably delivered 2,000 things, <laughs> but that's the way you get to the core, <laughs> and, and I let other people um, edit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, usually, I try to create a whole uh, graphic universe of, of, of visual language. And for a Michelle show, which is a, a, a huge topic, how, mm -hmm. do you, how do you corral American fashion mm -hmm. and fashioning America into uh, uh, an exhibition? Um, she did an incredible job of, of, of kind of giving a, a, a survey of the nooks and crannies of fashion that sometimes gets lost in history, mm -hmm. the incredible creators, the incredible points of views we're not privy to. Mm -hmm. um, fashion, it, for me, is such an alive art. It's very, there's nothing you can't throw at it that it won't spit back at you. And that's what's so modern about art. I mean, about fashion. Um, uh, for, for, first of all, as, as you know, I'm an artist, mm -hmm. but I do fashion illustration, commercial work, I do sculpture, portraiture, he furniture design. Yeah. Um, and that's, um, uh, basically I learned it all on the job from my wife, Isabel, who I'm sadly mm -hmm. without now. Um, we, but we um, Isabel created mm -hmm. a Michelle Obama's uh, inauguration look for the mm -hmm. first inauguration. Um, we were uh, working together always as a couple since we were 13 or 14 years old. Um, so I learned fashion from the very best. I learned how to cut and sew and what, what it takes to make a, a garment, how to make a pattern. My father was our tailor. Um, we worked in a, for, a studio on, on Tin Pan Alley in Manhattan all together um, and basically never had more than 10 people working with us. But um, we never produced more than what we could make. So um, Isabel's clothes are hard to find, but um, basically, we never changed our way of working in that we both uh, but butted into each other's worlds, whether mm -hmm. it was art or fashion, set design, theater, uh, costume design. Mm -hmm. And approaching a, an exhibition design is not unlike creating a movie set, only mm -hmm. that you can walk through it. So we tried to create a landscape mm -hmm. um, as big and broad as America is. Right. And that's what, one of the things that makes America so unique. We dress so many different climates, so many different clients, so many different people, mm -hmm. so many different um, social spheres mm -hmm. and um, pocketbooks mm -hmm. that, that that's what makes us unique. And yeah. um, the upward mobility of America is sensational mm -hmm. to me. As an immigrant, I could tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have to say that's one of the reasons I thought it would be so wonderful to invite Ruben to design the show because I think about your Cuban background and how you crafted your own fashion world in New York with Isabel and how you really worked in all those different media. Yeah. And that's why I felt it was so important to kind of think about how do we infuse the exhibition with that spirit of American in innovation and inventiveness and reinvention. Right, I mean, uh, uh, Isabel always called herself first a seamstress before she was a designer. She was very proud of that, because she could make a garment. She could sit down and make a garment. That's why when uh, we met Carl Lagerfeld, he said, you're a couturier, because mm -hmm. that's what a couturier can be. They could make a pattern, cut the fabric, sew it themselves, and make a dress. Mm -hmm. And the true meaning of the word couturier is an, a dress made by an artist. It's not about made to measure, it's not about that, that comes later, it's about a, the fact that a dress is made by an artist. Mm -hmm. Why? Because clothing holds our emotions, Hold, clothing and textile holds our, our heart, it really holds your story. Mm -hmm. And I think what Michelle tried to do is tell these stories mm -hmm. in, as, as, uh, as an overview of right. all the amazing quilt that America is, all, mm -hmm. the, all the stories that make up us. Right. 
Yeah, and it was incredibly challenging. Um, so I'll just kind of mention a few names to you. I think some of you have seen the show, but some of you may not. But um, Lloyd Kivanu, Phoebe, last name unknown, Mahitable Primus, Bill Witten, Madame Olenth, uh, Virgil Ortiz. Um, these are some of the names that don't really appear in fashion history books, and that was one of the things I really wanted to get at with the show is, you know, how come they're not there? How do we recraft this narrative? How do we reframe it? How do we look at those stories related to the human side of fashion production, right? Which is what you're talking about as well. Um, so, move forward. Um, I'm just gonna show a couple um, of my previous work. This was Hashtag Textile at the MFA Boston. This was Gender Bending Fashion, also at the MFA Boston. And one of the things that I loved about these projects is that I worked very closely with the designer who actually infused the design with the spirit of the exhibition content. And that was one reason I really wanted Ruben to work on this show. And I was so delighted that he said he would be a design consultant for it. Well, again, now, American fashion is very, has been very, very good to me, and it was very good to Isabel. We came as we were kids from Cuba and basically plunked down into the world of art and fashion and performance art and music. It was all one big beautiful stew. No one, uh, we didn't have to ask for permission to enter, we just did and we melted into those beautiful ingredients and swam in those waters. Mm -hmm. um, I did learn from the best, from Isabel and then, and then of course from our friends like Bill Cunningham and Carl Lagerfeld, Anna Piaggi, Beth Ann Hardison, mm -hmm. the Juan and uh, Juan, uh, Antonio Lopez, the illustrator and Juan Ramos. Uh, just so many names, Halston, um, Andy Warhol, of course. We met all these people as kids, and we didn't ask them to be our mentor. We just worked, and they absorbed us, and we absorbed them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's very special about growing up in a metropolitan and cosmopolitan mm -hmm. city and community, what you all are creating here in Crystal Bridges. It's so important because it takes all of our stories to create this, mm -hmm. this greatness, and everyone adds their ingredients. So yeah. And I think that this idea too of expanding the geography, I know this is something that the CFDA is doing with their CFDA Connects program. So a lot of the themes that we've addressed today, so connecting to other regional centers like Northwest Arkansas Fashion Week um, and Interforum, sustainability, um, body inclusivity, um, untold stories, indigenous design, all of these are really pressing important issues that need to be addressed It is, in and one big thing too, I gotta, I gotta say, when we were kids and bumped into uh, this world, um, this was, we were there, we learned this lesson and somehow it slipped away. So I want you to absorb the fact that it can, yes, we're here and we're learning this now and we're paying attention to it. Each, it's like, how should I say, it's like the tides, right? Everything, these ideas come in again and each, each time the tide gets higher, that's a very good thing, but make sure it's not just window dressing. Make sure you mm -hmm. really absorb it and understand it and take it because it makes us all stronger, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and also what's brilliant about fashion design, it's that it's two words, remember. Fashion comes and goes, it fades, we forget. Fashion is very fickle, and we like it that way. But design is permanent, design stays. So those, that combination is very unique, and you have to understand both of those things, right? Design is logical. <laughs> design is logical and, and never-ending, but fashion is the flavor of the day, so allow that. Don't, don't fight it. Mm -hmm. but understand it. And I think as creators, as all types of creators, whether you're an artist, a choreographer, mm -hmm. a writer, a poet, a filmmaker, understand that and, and, and live in those two worlds. That's, that's what I think artists are good at. They live in those two worlds, mm -hmm. right? And also fashion is an ideal, yeah. but we sometimes don't reach that ideal, but that's okay. You try again and again and mm -hmm. again. Yeah, and I think that, Ruben, your intimate understanding of fashion construction and also what actually goes on behind the scenes to create these garments, as well as being a designer and an illustrator and an exhibition and a mannequin designer, I mean, the multimedia approach you have was really so fabulous for this show. And that's why I thought he's the one. Like, And well, I was so great. thrilled and that he said yes. Michelle's <laughs> so. adding in of pop culture was also very important because that's a big element of American mm -hmm. fashion. Um, yep. Pop is easy to absorb. That's mm -hmm. why we're so good at making yeah. pop, right? right? Europe has royalty. We have Hollywood. We have mm -hmm. pop stars. We have rappers. We have mm -hmm. now social media. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 who we hold up as gods and goddesses. And then, then we throw them away when we don't right. need them. Right. But that's that's the nature of the beast. It is. And, th and that's a really important aspect of the show is how pop culture and Hollywood and media and video that communicates American fashion to the rest of the world. And so this idea of kind of streetwear that has swept the globe, really, I mean, that is American inventiveness and that is American innovation at its best. And it has had such an impact. And so, you know, that has been a lot of what I've been trying to do with the show is kind of think about these distinctly American forms 
that are exported and known as American, right? Because it is hard to define American fashion. But I do feel Not like- for me. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, By the way, if anyone yeah. has any questions, feel free to butt in and, and, and add yeah. your point, because yeah. that's the whole point. Yeah, but it, it's tough. And so the way I approached it was really to think about what are those distinctive forms, and that's why the exhibition progresses from grit you know, kind of inspired by kind of the American landscape, utilitarian garb, hardworking utilitarian wear, and goes all the way through glamour. Um, so, um, and Ruben. And speaking about utilitarian, when yeah. I, uh, I st first started working at Fiorucci when I was a kid, and then worked at a place called Unique Clothing Warehouse, which only sold old surplus World War II nurses' outfits and um, workwear and things that um, my job was to go mm -hmm. into the sub sub basement below the the mm -hmm. subways, mm -hmm. jump over the rats, and look in through these boxes, and um, these clothes were then um, discovered later. I would sell them to Issey Miyake and Terry Mugler in Montana, mm -hmm. which was incredible to send see Europe pick up an American utilitarian World War II clothes and turn mm -hmm. them into avant-garde European fashion, and in turn, that it was, it's, mm -hmm. it, what I'm trying to get at is that the fashion cycle is, is fascinating for me, and it's, um, it's a beautiful ecosystem, right? Um, streetwear feeds mm -hmm. couture, which spits it back at streetwear, mm -hmm. and it's this beautiful, they're like twins joined right. at the hip, mm -hmm. um, but each one wants to outdo the other yes. constantly, and yeah. they do. Yeah. But now American streetwear has, has completely taken has over the globe. completely taken over. Because it's, it's easy kind to of wear amazing. and it communicates. Right, exactly, and that's why I think, I, if I don't know, if I wanna go back, maybe I can't. Anyway, um, let's just move forward then. So, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of what we're kind of talking about is kind of these untold stories and untold narratives, as well as this progress from grit to glamour. Um, these are two pieces in the show. Um, one we think attributed to Mehitable Primus, who was a 19th century um, black dressmaker in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and again, like we don't know much about her. There are a lot of stories like that in the show where we don't have the history, we don't have the objects. You know, so, so are you working on that to give us a history? Yeah, well, we did our best, but <laughs> still, there's still a lot less known, you know, a lot that's not known. But um, what I wanted to kind of think about in terms of Ruben's involvement is kind of what those different themes are. So grit and streetwear and um, swimwear, you know, again, key American exports of American style. Um, something like the nudie suit by um, Nudie Cone. I mean, amazing. When I think about what is very uniquely American, the nudie suit is, is that, you know? And he started out, he was a Ukrainian Im immigrant who came to Hollywood and started dressing burlesque stars and then created this very, very distinctive American form of this rhinestone cowboy suit and is carried on by, you know, um, by uh, now designers like Court Lonesome in Austin, Texas, which is a woman-run atelier who makes these new nudie suits. So how do you kind of capture that energy and vibrancy? So I'd love Ruben to kind of walk through some of the galleries and talk, have Ruben talk about his design. Well, back to just uh, trying to create a landscape. We were mm -hmm. trying to create, first of all, um, echo the landscape here at Crystal Bridges, which mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. Um, nature is a big part of American fashion. Mm -hmm. We don't um, generally think of nature influencing us, but it mm -hmm. sure does. And we try to create a landscape that mimics the, the Wild West and, the, mm -hmm. and the, the, the kind of beautiful Rocky Mountain highness that mm -hmm. we all mm -hmm. search for, mm -hmm. but also wanted to create a kind of fashion landscape that you can walk past, right? Mm -hmm. the, the initial idea was to walk past mountains of crinolines mm -hmm. and valleys of corsets, and mm -hmm. uh, but that was out of the question. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. So, so we had a always have budget to, and time, yeah, you know, right, work corrals within, us back in. Work, but. work within a museum budget, but I loved you know, these designs came in, you had sent them to me, and I'll never forget the day I opened them up and I like just screamed to my husband, look at these amazing designs for well, this show. Well, of course, show. I wanted to be so here fabulous. for a month just hand painting the walls and the, and the floor and yeah. everything because yeah. I wanted people to feel immersed in a painting. Right. But right. again, that, that was but they're, they're so, <laughs> I know, sadly. But they're so wonderful and they really captured the spirit of the themes. And that's what I think was so incredible. So that was Ruben's design. This is where we're at. We actually see Isabel's work there, the dress, which is a quote unquote denim dress. Maybe you want to talk well, about that. That's from denim. the first there, uh, collection. When we first started, yeah. our collections were only denim and cotton and t-shirting and things that we can get our hands on because we had no money. Mm -hmm. And eventually we were able to buy fabrics. And by that time, denim was 
no American company sold denim anymore, which mm -hmm. was shocking. This right. is like maybe 1980, 81. They stopped yeah. making denim in America. Right. But and we actually, found so we found a, an, an Italian maker mm -hmm. who was making denim linen, yeah. and there was a blend of that. Mm -hmm. So so that was their version of denim, mm -hmm. and, and we were able to. And buy wasn't that. her first collection though actually made of denim? It was and all denim. Yeah, all that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Our first collection at Burgess was just denim, cotton denim. T shirts, right. and linen. It was right. like the, the most inexpensive thing. Yeah, we could find. and I love that kind of utilitarian nature Completely. of the fabric that Isabel was responding Completely. to. Right. And um, later on, when she was using uh, Duchess satin and double faced cashmere's mm -hmm. and things from Italy, she mm -hmm. would still hand wash them on the roof. We would lay them out because she liked things that were worn and that were mm -hmm. used before you mm -hmm. wore it. So the fabrics were incredible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, double ply, triple ply with silks, but you can sleep in them. So she mm -hmm. loved that part of Americanism that does, everything doesn't have to be starched and right. ready. It's, it's used and worn. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, these are a few of the objects in the show, which again, I'm not gonna focus as specifically on the objects so we can get through our time here. Um, but I did wanna point out this amazing Charles Scheeler painting because I used a lot of the works in the Crystal Bridges collection in the show and this collection is full of treasures. Mm -hmm. And so this is a Charles Scheeler painting of the Amistog denim mills in Manchester, New Hampshire. And we have Levi's that were milled at, you know, gold miner era Levi's that were milled at that mill. Um, and as Ruben said, denim production in this country, you know, it just doesn't exist. Um, the last salvage denim factory, Cone Denim Mills, closed just a few years ago, and there's really That's nothing. So. Um, here's a wonderful picture of you and Isabel in the denim suit, the denim denim suit, suit from yeah, the first which, collection. Which it I was think. a woman's suit that sold at Burgdorf, but of course I was yeah. in drag, so I always got to wear Isabel's clothes. I'm actually wearing one of her jackets now, it. so it's I'm great. in a woman's jacket yes it's fabulous i know i just love that photo Through agenda. Uh, yeah exactly um and then grit um I, again I'm, i think we don't have a lot of time but i just did want to point out what america was doing when christian dior was introducing his new look which is um levi strauss was one of about four designers from san francisco that they sent over to paris for this fashion show, and they were showcasing American fashion the same time Christian Dior was doing his new look, and they were showing looks like this. Right, and, Denim, and also, and also we have a journalist yeah. friend in Paris who said that the real new look, when Dior introduced his new look, were mm -hmm. the American girls first coming over in their uh, Levi's jeans and yes. sloppy shirt tails, right. and everything was oversized, and their, and their hair was pinned up mm -hmm. on their head, and they were wearing bright le red lipstick. Right. And so they, they, the, the French were just shocked that mm -hmm. Americans were this casual and right. had the guts to have so much style. Right. but be so sloppy and yeah. messy at the same time. <laughs> but they love that fresh air, you they, know? So yeah. And again, that's what's beautiful about fashion, the strictness, the, the polish, the mm -hmm. severeness, contrasted with this, like, right. let it all hang out exactly, spirit. Exactly, right. It, which it drives from one thing starts to the other. Yeah, I know, and I think is captured in the Battle of Versailles, you know, which, of course, we have an homage to in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Yes. With Beth Ann, <laughs> with the Beth original Anne, star yes, of. fabulous. Um, so anyway, other Crystal Bridges works. Uh, Rosie the Riveter, I was so delighted. They let me pull it out of the permanent collection to put in. It's just was the a key. Frame's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. The frame is amazing. The amazing. It's amazing. But you know, a key moment in fashion history when women moved into the factories to work for the war effort. And that led to really the acceptability of women wearing denim and trousers and boiler suits and pants. And so I was so delighted it, it was in there. Um, and then just wanted to point out uh, Gnu Jeans, which is an image um, on your right. Um, an indigenous owned denim company in Portland, um, Oregon. And so, you know, the indigenous story is really key and it's an undercurrent in the exhibition because um, they really need more of a platform. And um, they're working with, um, like doing collaborations with Pendleton Blankets, um, another like deeply rooted American firm and really doing wonderful work. Pendleton's great. Yeah, really great. And then Mimi Prober's work uh, made out of crazy quilts, sustainable. Um, to the you know nth degree in many ways, we're using these 19th century crazy quilts to craft them into these beautifully modern uh, pieces. Uh, so streetwear, the zoot suit to Z Dapper Dan. Um, so again, I won't cover a lot of specifics related to this. Um, we know what happened with Dapper Dan and Gucci. <laughs> so anyway, um, kind of amazing though. I think just this really incredible story of somebody who you know was pretty much driven out of business for co-opting those luxury logos and then was knocked off by Gucci and is now working for Gucci. But just, you know, the power of American ingenuity and innovation And the in power fashion. of fashion, again, you can't spit anything at it that it won't spit right back right. at you. So that's the beauty of it, yeah, right? Yeah, it's true. And so uh, do you want to talk a little about your ideas for the streetwear gallery? Well, we wanted streetwear to really move and to be um, very, very modern and very dynamic, like what it is. 
Um, and just the fact that it's so accessible is, is a beautiful thing we tried to capture in, mm -hmm. in the exhibition. And also it's some optimism about the yeah. future. You yes. know, streetwear yeah. is just so, yeah. it's so optimistic mm -hmm. about the future, no matter what, even yeah. in dark times. Right. And we need that. We, we really do need, need that. Need we do, and I have to say, I really looked hard for mannequins that look like that, but they don't exist. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, but maybe Not next yet. show. But next yeah, show. So, uh, and also for young creators, the future really is in your hands, you know? Mm -hmm. we, we want that, and even if you're starting from streetwear, which if that's your thing, or if you mm -hmm. want to start at couture, that's your thing too, that's great, but be sincere about what you're creating and love it. Mm -hmm. If you don't love it, no one else will, remember that. So don't, don't like what Bethan was saying before, don't fool yourself, if you're not feeling it, let it go, and, mm -hmm. and but if you're feeling it, go for it, you mm -hmm. know? Very yeah, important. It's very important. And I'm really delighted that, again, we had this beautiful uh, painting by Jordan Castile that uh, we were able to pull for the permanent collection of a shop owner, 125th Street in Harlem, that just looked, it just resonated so beautifully with the point of the streetwear um, ensembles. We have work by Olivia Anthony, um, who's here today, will be at the gala, um, and she um, is the rare woman designer in streetwear, um, as well as work by Virgil Ortiz, um, indigenous uh, Cochiti Pueblo designer, who does beautiful work. And you might know his name because he collaborated with Donna Karen about uh, 20 years ago, and has that kind of really spurned him to work in fashion. Um, we've got an accessories section. I'm going to keep moving because I think we're going to run out of time. American accessories spanning the 1830s all the way up to the present. Smaller firms like I. Miller in New York City, um, you know, had a hugely long career, an important career in New York. The building still stands. It's amazing. Um, but looking at that history of um, shoemaking in America, which we were the you know, biggest shoe producer in the world, and most of it was centered in Massachusetts, actually. So we have a number of Massachusetts examples. Um, this is my kind of fashion family tree. I was really interested in thinking about how people are interrelated, how they started, um, you know, what are the key um, kind of influences in people's lives, you know, working in design houses, working at schools, um, the music industry, and Hollywood, and how that is all kind of interwoven in a really compelling way. Um, undergarments and innovation, you know, I felt like that's a real woman's story in many ways. Um, a lot of women entrepreneurs and inventors were able to find success working in undergarments because they're more intimately associated with the female form. Um, so we have a number of people there from 19th century corset designers all the way to Savage Times Fenty. And I just wanted to show this design that Ruben had for well, the undergarments. I'm a section. big fan of underwear. Um, I don't know if you all are, but <laughs> the idea that clothes, um, again, undergarments were there to protect the outside of your clothes. So people forget that. They're the first utilitarian garments, really. Mm -hmm. So they're there to protect the finery we're going to show outside. So all these layers were, were really that. They were protection. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful to see also, of course, the architecture and foundation that came from there, too, mm -hmm. whether it's whale bones. Mm -hmm. Some cultures use bamboo or things that were flexible, but they mm -hmm. still give you the sturdiness. And also it was a way to, sh of course, uh, build architecture into your clothes mm -hmm. until we figured out how to make it easier, right. which happened in America, too. It Just did. Uh, how to shape clothing without all that and how to bend and breathe and move. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an American innovation, which it is, is beautiful. And also, like, the development of fibers like Lastex and spandex and all of this, which is, you know, really the technology behind these garments that really changed the game in terms of how women dress themselves because it made for a much lighter weight, you know, kind of uh, under structure for them. And, and again, women innovators were really a big part of that. Um, so there's where we ended with the uh, intimate section with Ruben's design, which I think he wanted to kind of create a soft kind of corner there for the, for the intimates, right? Um, and then beachwear, um, we're focused for primarily on mid-century beachwear. I would have loved to have included a lot more. Every time Ruben and I would have a meeting, he's like, I love all these pieces, but why aren't there more? <laughs> and I kept having to explain to him, we have a budget we're trying to work within, and we can only have so many things. But um, this is kind of mid-century, and Ruben kind of envisioned this, um, you know, kind of beach. Well, America, American yeah. uh, uh, beachwear basically is pool parties, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the glamour. Of, it's not meant to be wet. It's the glamour <laughs> of, of hanging out by the pool and having a cocktail, and I think that right. was a, that was yeah. unique in Europe. Yeah. Um, but when Europeans saw that here in America, there's this whole like fantasy world built around the swimming pool and the mm -hmm. backyard totally and true. the resorts. That was mm -hmm. like that blew their mind that we created these fantasy landscapes. Right. And, and again, that's that's a that's a form of how fashion leaks into architecture and how and home design mm -hmm. and, and community design. That was kind of interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. And you know, by the 1940s and 50s, America was the biggest exporter of bathing suits in the world. And a lot of it had to do with Hollywood, which is why we have some Hollywood clips playing in there, because that communicated that kind of California lifestyle. And you look at some of these suits and you think, would you ever wear them in water? You know, they're really not about utilitarian. It's about style. It's about fashion. It's about kind of innovative design. Um, Alfred Shaheen is a Hawaiian designer responsible for the Hawaiian shirt. So um, I wanted to make sure that we incorporated Hawaii, Puerto Rico, um, really, again, expanding the geography beyond, you know, the two coasts and thinking about other contributors to American fashion. Um, Crystal Bridges Labor and Industry print collection is amazing. Um, we have a number of those there. And I think, again, to Ruben's point about the people working behind the scenes, I felt it was important to include that aspect of it. So we have images of sweatshops, a New England factory town, lace makers in Puerto Rico. I mean, these are the people fueling the garment industry, and it's really important to include that. Well, we forget that a lot of people just stepped right off the boat as immigrants without speaking English and were able to sit at a mm -hmm. sewing machine and sew and make a living. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it was hard work, but there was, mm -hmm. a, there was a stepping up immersion, mm -hmm. um, which we forget that. And a lot of family, small family businesses started that way. That's a, that's a pretty amazing thing. Mm -hmm. So as we think about being makers, and as we think about creating things, remember that that the the, the more you you can how do I say it? The more you can um, uh, grow your own talent, but also give other people a way a way to step up and step forward is really important and very beautiful. Mm -hmm. That always kept us going too. Every time we were able to grow, uh, uh, we, we were kind of like um, selfish about. We loved what we did, so we didn't want it to change that much. So we produced everything we could there. But the ability to take in new people to work with us and to take in students and have and see them open up their shops and and uh, and hire people. That was a beautiful thing. How that spreads and being a maker, that that can happen. It can happen, and I think that that is a challenge for a curator of you know because where do those stories live? Like, you know, they live in these objects, but actually a lot of those stories haven't been preserved, right? So like all of the laborers behind the scenes, how do you represent that in a show, well, you know? You, you, you do speak you do, to it, and you, you certainly it did. And, and, you it, and also yeah. people like Ann Lowy, who made Jackie Kennedy's right. wedding dress. How right. forward is that, that Jackie Kennedy wore a black yeah. woman's dress? That was really radical when you think about it. Right. And, and she and Ann Lowy worked for Hattie Carnegie, mm -hmm. which was, uh, you know, the right. hoity-toity mm -hmm. um, 1930s right. couturier shop in mm -hmm. New York where Charles James worked. So just to think of Ann Lowy working with Charles James mm -hmm. in this, uh, serving these women, these socialites from Manhattan in 1930s and 40s. When you watch that movie, The Women, mm -hmm. that's that world. You know, that right. is that world. So picture Anne Lowy making right. dresses for these women. That's yeah. kind of radical. It is. It's pretty amazing. And also not really getting the credit at the time. And this is exactly. a real issue because now, of course, she has seen this renaissance of interest. Um, everybody wants to find an Anne Lowe dress now. And, Anne Lowe was <laughs> and it's really hard to, you know, kind of access Yes, that. and the wedding dress yeah. just like the one we know, but her, she was yeah. genius. The clothing she made yeah. for herself under her label was genius. So right. innovative, so mm -hmm. just so modern. And then, then, of course, the taste, the taste level mm -hmm. was there that was like beyond. Right, right. And so then American Ready to Wear, I just wanted to point out, we of course have Claire McCardle. There were plenty of other designers I could have included, but again, limited for space. Um, but Lloyd Kivanu, a Cherokee designer, um, who again, you don't find him in the fashion history books, but he should be there. Very successful career as a fashion maker. He was sold in Neiman Marcus. He dressed Miss America. Uh, where is his name? Why isn't it there? And I feel like that is something that needs to be kind of addressed. His work is beautiful. But then went on to, you know, found the Institute of American Indian Arts and trained generations of designers, um, indigenous and Native American designers. Um, we have, of course, yes, the Battle of Versailles, this key moment, um, you know, that kind of put American fashion on the map and how it really did help kind of inform this idea of, you know, what, how American fashion is different from French couture, right? Yeah, and, and, and again, just, uh, yes, the designs were modern, but the people who wore them and how they wore mm -hmm. them and the spirit, the spirit yeah. of these women, the spirit of, of Americanism, the spirit mm -hmm. of freedom is so hard to define. Mm -hmm. It's not just a sweater, it's not just a dress, right. it's not just a pair of jeans, it's something else. Mm -hmm. And but, but, the, but fashion is what dresses that emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it goes back to yeah. fashion and clothing and textile carries our emotions. It mm -hmm. carries the, the, the vibrations of our right. feelings. That's very important. Yeah, and I think that is one of the other re many reasons that I was so happy Ruben took this on as a consultant because he gets that spirit, right? And that's why for like the pop art section, you think of a distinctly American art form and pop art is it, right? So how many designers have actually kind of 
channeled that um, and used that in their own design. And he sure. came up with this really well, brilliant way of displaying. Well, again, pop was like, uh, there was a moment in the 60s where people could like go into a vending machine and yank out a dress. That's mm -hmm. like, that was the dream, <laughs> right? For 60 cents, I could just wear a paper dress. And they did. Mm -hmm. That was kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, there was the spirit of modernism and, and, and don't be so fussy about things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and the, the way Andy Warhol always told us, if you look at prostitutes, they're wearing they're wearing the clothes that we'll all be wearing 100 years from now. And he was right. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's that that goes back to street fashion. There's, right. That goes back to utilitarianism. Right. They wore it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And now we all do too. We do. It's true. I know. And actually, we're running out of time. So I can't go through the whole show. But um, Any questions or yeah, any, any maybe feedback? Maybe we've got just a couple minutes. There must be some young creator I'll just that wants to know flip something. Through. I would love to... Um, oh, I see somebody's eyebrows going okay. over here. I would love to... Um, also, just make sure we kind of end a little bit with Refashioning America, which is really about designers who are rethinking the story of American fashion through the lens of social justice, through the lens of sustainability, through the lens of kind of rethinking black history, um, like Pierre Moss, um, Akira Jones, Jamie Okuma, uh, indigenous designer, um, really doing important work. And that's really a, a key, key message of the exhibition. Yeah, so, and I think we're pretty much done for time, as much as we could go on and on, but um, thank you all for um, sticking with us. Yeah.